The Godfather movies are some of the most well-regarded and iconic films ever made, but I never actually sat down and fully watched them until recently. That was for two major reasons. The first one being these movies are extremely long and it's a pretty big commitment to sit down and watch them in one sitting. The second is I didn't think I could really appreciate them because I didn't really know anything about the Mafia. And I think to enjoy these films, you have to have at least some understanding of what a made man is, what a capo is, what a conciliary is, how the five families and the commission operate. I think you get a lot more out of watching these films if you have at least some idea about the background. So recently I started reading, just because it looked interesting, Five Families, The Rise, Decline and Resurgence of America's Most Powerful Mafia Empires, which is basically a complete history of the American Mafia that focuses rather heavily on many biographies of important figures like Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, and many others. So I got most of the way through it, and I felt I had a pretty good understanding of the Mafia structure, kind of its history and the major figures within it. So I decided to sit down and watch the movies. I have to say, having read most of the book, I'm up to the 2000s, so I'm familiar with all the time period that The Godfather is referencing. Uh, it did greatly help the movie to understand kind of all the subtext, to kind of see who different characters were based on and who were they inspired by and kind of understanding the culture. So I would really recommend the book, uh, excellent book, and it gives a lot of context. Beyond that though, what can really be said about movies that have been so overly analyzed and talked about and reviewed and are so universally beloved? I'm going to say that when watching them, two things really stuck out to me, and it was good that I had read the book first. So the book Five Families actually talks about The Godfather, and it's very critical of the movie, not in terms of it being a bad movie, but the problem with it was it was almost too good a movie. It presents this very idealized version of what the American mob is like. The movie and the book it's based on go to, uh, goes to a very great length to try to humanize all the characters, to give them logical motivations, to try to make it look like the decisions they made were forced by circumstances, to try to pretend that they have this great moral code of honor and loyalty and respect. And that the mafia didn't victimize the local community. They were the providers of basic social services. And the police department was hopelessly corrupt. And there is some small grades of truth to this. But it really does kind of sweep away. And I get that there's a lot of violence and corruption and horrible things that go on in the movies. But most of the core characters are honorable mafiosos. They're family men, they're community men, they're fundamentally decent people. What is it that they say in the Dark Knight? Um, we were decent men in an indecent time. If you look at a lot of the characters, in particular Michael, it reminds me a lot of Breaking Bad, in that if you look at almost any of the decisions that Michael makes, Within the particular situation, they are appropriate and justifiable, but kind of the cumulative results of them tend to be somewhat disastrous. But the point is that the Godfather movies present this very idealized version of the mafia and kind of glance over all the just horrendous stuff that happened as a result of it. All the people who fell into debt slavery because they couldn't pay a loan shark back the dr dramatically inflated prices that the people of New York had to pay due to the uh, various mafia families taking cuts out of the uh, the fishing market, the fish market, and out of grocers, and all these other, pr and heating, and oil, and coal, and clothing, all these industries that were either controlled by the mafia or that they took a cut out of, 
And these increased prices were passed on to the average person. Often poor people would have tr increasing trouble making ends meet uh, because of all the graft and corruption that went into this. The labor movement in New York and a lot of America was also a puppet of the mafia. And uh, striking or not striking was often cases more of a reflection of what the mafia wanted and how much money they could wring out of the employers than whether or not the workers were actually being treated properly. And that's to say nothing of the immense corrupting impact it had on politics, getting politicians to lavish massive amounts of public money on construction projects and sanitation projects and all kinds of other stuff that cost five to ten times as much. And I think a lot of that tends to get overlooked by kind of these anecdotes. Like if you look at all the nice stuff that Don Vito does in The Godfather and Michael always just wanted to go legitimate, he was a good boy. He didn't do nothing. He was, every time he tried to get out, they tried to pull him back in. And I get it. In terms of this being a story, if you were going to make all of the main characters complete irredeemable douchebags who were just all 100% corrupt and stuff like that, it wouldn't be a good story. It wouldn't be a good movie. If the Corleones weren't the like angels of the underworld if they weren't the like the best of the worst these films wouldn't work and they wouldn't be the classics they were or rather they are but there's a there's a cost to that and the cost is that it it glamorized and continues to glamorize the mafia you do have to wonder how many like poor italian kids in new york or chicago saw these movies and decided to get involved with it uh, I'm not saying that they should be banned or anything. I'm just saying that's kind of the reality. And they talk a bit about that in the, the book, The Five Families. It's just kind of something to keep in mind. Is sometimes when you're dealing with something that's kind of historical fiction, you do have to either um, play it up and polish it and make it look like this particular figure or this particular time period was amazing. And there was nothing wrong with it. Or what a lot of people do, where the medieval ages were 100% horrible, everything was 100% corrupt, that kind of thing. The reality is generally somewhere in between. And I'm not saying that there aren't good guys and bad guys and there aren't good and bad societies. But generally speaking, these things are a lot more complicated than they can kind of come out being in movies. So that's kind of the first observation I, I had. Uh, the second observation was that it's, I think it's an interesting exploration of one of the oldest political questions there is. And that is, is it better to be feared or loved? And Machiavelli said, uh, of course, it's better if you can be both, but it's better to be feared than loved. And this is something I've thought about for a long time. And you guys know I've read a lot of biographies and I've read a lot of history. Um, I actually have the complete opposite view. I think it's a lot better to be loved than feared. And the reason for that is I think fear breeds resentment by its very nature. Somebody who you fear is going to whack you or you fear is going to steal from you or exploit you you innately resent them and you will at the first chance you get decide to not pay them or try to cheat them or even try to take them out. I think being a figure who governs primarily through fear does lead to a target being put on your back and does, I think there's a lot of truth to six Semper Tyrannus. If you go too far with being a despot regardless of what level it's at, uh, someone is going to try to kill you. Where on the other hand, if you're loved, you can still get overthrown in a coup. Some ambitious army officer or whatever can still remove you, but the people of the nation will like you and they will, be, they will support you. 
and you won't have to necessarily fear about being overthrown by them. Also, it's just, I think, a better, I don't know, a, to use kind of an RPG term, a passive buff to have most of the people in position of power be more favor, more likely to like you than to resent and be terrified by you. And if we want to talk about legacy, I think if you're loved, your legacy will probably last longer, or at least last longer for reasons that are good for you. That people will remember you as a benevolent person, as a wise leader, as a wise ruler, as something like that, rather than just despising you and being the byword for something negative. And I think that's the big difference between Michael and Vito. Vito, I think, understood that you need a balance of the two. You need a carrot and the stick. You need to treat your people well, pay your people well. If possible, it's preferable to try to resolve things in a way that's mutually beneficial. It's, it's better to try to resolve ways things it's important that the other person if it's possible goes away thinking that they've been dealt with squarely and that they've gotten something out of the deal likewise one of the single most important things a politician or any kind of leader can have is to at least give the impression that they care about you specifically that you actually matter to them that either in kind of a larger abstract way or in a personal way, you matter to them. They care about you. They care about your well-being. And you see this a lot with Vito is even if it's just some like random minor person, he'll still take the time to talk to them, maybe do them a favor. And it's it's if nothing else is good PR like if you do a favor for somebody it doesn't really cost you very much in terms of time or money but that person will be in your pocket and they'll tell everybody else that you're a great guy and that alone might even if you never call in that favor that alone might be the difference um, in terms of your overall reputation. At the same time, if you screwed with Vito, if you rejected his generosity, if you rejected what he thought was a square deal, an offer that you can't refuse, then he would go full balls to the wall and take you out and destroy your business and kill your $800,000 racehorse and put the head in the, the bed. But I think when, you, when you're looking at the offer you can't refuse, there's the two sides to it. On the first end, it's very generous. Uh, generally speaking, it's generous, it's mutually beneficial. Uh, he might even be offering you more than what it would really cost. Like in the case of the uh, the movie role, it would have actually been to the director's benefit financially solely in terms of the fact that the person in question was perfect for the part. It would have made the movie more successful. Uh, Vito was offering to take care of labor disputes. He was offering to... Uh, possibly partially finance the, the picture if that was necessary. It was a very good offer from a business perspective. Um, so it wouldn't be logical to refuse it from a carrot perspective. But there's also, of course, the stick where the guy refused and he sent a message that if you're going to continue to refuse, next time it's going to be your head instead of the head of your racehorse. Michael, I feel, took a very different perspective that it's it's better to be feared and only feared. I just find whenever he's dealing with someone, he doesn't necessarily even offer them anything. He just says, you're going to do this, and if you don't do this, I'm going to whack you or destroy you or ruin you. And very much the, the negotiations with him just feel like he's dictating terms to the person and he has the assumption that he's already won and he's the, the other person's already surrendered. Uh, Michael's also just an extremely cold person. Uh, there's not really anything to like about him. Like, who actually likes Michael um, personally or actually loves him as a person? I guess his wife, his kids, Tom, maybe Fredo... 
there's probably a couple other people, but he's kind of a massive dick to all of them. Uh, he doesn't let them participate in anything. He never talks to them. He doesn't spend time with them. In the second movie, he frequently just yells at Tom and tries to humiliate him, even though Tom is literally the only competent person left who he can really trust implicitly. Um, that's just kind of the way he is. And you can really see from the Godfather one onward I can't really think of too many new people that Michael brought in. Vito had a talent for finding people who were competent or loyal or could otherwise work together and recruiting them into his organization and keeping them loyal through a mixture of respect, fear, and generosity. But Michael didn't really operate that way. Um, once again, he did kind of take a much more corporate perspective where the family was more of a, a mega corporation than a family. And maybe that had to change, and maybe that was just kind of the way that things were moving. And uh, Vito was a dinosaur, and he kind of did need to change. But it didn't ultimately really work for Michael. Everybody around him either betrayed him or left him, and he was left with basically no one reliable under him to... To deal with it and there wasn't really anyone to replace any of the excellent people Vito had hired um it was just it seemed like it was mostly just nobodies or yes men the fact that Michael made um Fredo his underboss I think is a very good example of his leadership style he just picked the weakest most pliant yes man who wouldn't challenge him who wouldn't take any initiative as a way of further centralizing his power. I'm not sure if the capos he picked were similarly either weak or submissive people who couldn't think for themselves. But while loyalty is probably the single most important trait an employee can have, it can't be the only trait an employee can have. And the loyalty has to at least part be based on affection or a common purpose. It can't solely be based on fear. But I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. I think Vito understood you need to be both feared and loved. You need the carrot and the stick. You have to be able to share your burdens, at least somewhat with the people around you, and have some sort of trust in them. Whereas Michael just tried to do everything himself. It also reminds me of great historical leaders like Justinian. Uh, Justinian was a man of supreme intelligence and talent, who brought the Byzantine Empire to untold heights. But he undertook so many projects at once, the reconquest of the Mediterranean, uh, the uh, modernizing the legal code, uh, mass production, uh, building programs, all this stuff, which he could handle and juggle, but a man less than Justinian, and there weren't many men of his caliber, couldn't handle a situation like that. So maybe that's what can be said about both of them, but particularly with Michael, because he didn't really have anybody else left that he could turn to. Um, maybe a Michael could manage the Corleone family, but his successors definitely couldn't. And to my understanding, after he made uh, Sonny's son the, the next heir, uh, I think his name was Vincent, the Empire crumbled quite rapidly uh, because he was the only one who could more or less hold it together. So those are some thoughts on The Godfather. Um, I hope you found it 